The Stephen Lee essay is called Assess the Changes Made by the Nazis in the Mass Media and Culture and the Impact of These on the German People. Okay, so um, the, the essay is broken into two sections, which he um, sums up here in the uh, introduction. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to produce two podcasts, um, one for each of these two sections. Um, and the two sections are, okay, the, the distinction that needs to be made. Okay, so first of all, um, the use of mass media um, to, uh, 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 through, through propaganda. Okay, so mass media, um, which is uh, media such as the radio, cinema, and the press, which is what this podcast will focus on. Uh, the next podcast will focus on sort of higher culture, um, less constant, less direct, less high impact, but nevertheless important if we're going to be assessing popular opinion, um, which of course is a section B um, focus, or could be a section B focus in the exam. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at the, uh, the, the sort of uh, more highbrow culture aspects in the second podcast. Um, the other common feature that just obviously I think is a fairly obvious point is that um, all aspects of media, whether it is mass media or whether it is um, more narrow culture, um, was brought under the control of Joseph Goebbels. And of course, the ministry that was created in March 1933 was called the Ministry of People's Enlightenment and Propaganda. But the specific organisation within the ministry um, of of uh, people's enlightenment and propaganda that you need um, to be aware of was what we call the Reich Chamber of Culture. Okay, uh, and within that, there were actually seven sub chambers. Each sub chamber was responsible for a different form of media radio, cinema, um, and so on and so forth. So you'll, be, you'll come across the references to chambers uh, frequently. That was the sort of main. Um, organisation that was used to Gleichschaltung, um, coordinate to bring media under um, German, under uh, Nazi control. Okay, so let's get into the details of this. Okay, so what Lee does is he basically, um, uh, for mass media, focuses in on those three main elements. Okay, so radio, then cinema, then the press. And for each of those media elements. It's a fairly straightforward approach you take. He first of all outlines what the policies were towards that media, how it was how it was brought under control, um, and the objectives, um, the, the reasons for bringing it under control, and then he analyzes to, um, how far those objectives were met. So there's an assessment. Um, were, were the Nazis successful in using um, that media to um, indoctrinate uh, to, to influence po uh, popular opinion. Okay, so the radio, let's go through the key points. So, first point that's made is Goebbels, it, um, very, very modern um, uh, in, in his approach. He, he had a very, very um, perceptive, he was very perceptive of new technologies, new opportunities. So he immediately grasped the potential of radio. Remember, radio was a new form of technology in those days. Um, it was the, so very, very modern, and he could see its potential for 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 mass influence. Okay, and I think well, you you, you do already know we've we've spoken about on the Lee doesn't mention it, but remember the thirty first of um, January, the first day that Hitler, his first full day in office, um, he immediately launched into broadcasting with his appeal to the German people, which was on the radio. Okay. Um, so Germany's radio organisations um, were coordinated and centralised um, and brought under state control. And the um, Nazi, um, I suppose the equivalent of the BBC, was um, the Nazi organisation that was created, was called the Reich Radio Company. Okay. Um, to a large extent, that was fairly straightforward. There's a good section in Noakes and Pridham um, on um, media and on the different um, uh, how that was brought into control. But the the, the, the radio 
um, was already um, largely state controlled um, uh, in the Weimar Republic as, as opposed to controlled by private companies. So in contrast to, for example, the press, which was uh, newspapers were largely privately owned, they were not state controlled in the Weimar Republic. So that in itself uh, made it reasonably straightforward for the Nazis to bring the radio under, um, under their control. Um, so the subchamber, um, uh, there was a subchamber for uh, radio uh, in the Reich Chamber of Culture. Um, Goebbels immediately gave the priority in the radio to political broadcast and gave Hitler a huge amount of airtime. Um, so the radio was very much used to enhance the sort of Hitler myth, the Fuhrer cult. Um, that a bit formed part of the propaganda campaign in the rise to power. If you, you remember in the rise to power, that unlike the other political parties, the Nazis very much focused on Hitler, the leader of the Nazi party, rather than the Nazi message. Uh, so, for example, in 1933, Hitler made 50 broadcasts in total. OK, so the radio was very much used to strengthen that sense of the people's community, the Volkskammerschaft. Um, in the way in which it was utilised. So, of course, um, collective listening was a key feature. Radios um, uh, broadcasting their messages through speakers in factories and in, in virtually every workplace. Um, so everybody was exposed to Hitler's uh, speeches um, in blocks of flats, in, in um, communal areas in blocks of flats and in public places. Um, often in the open, in parks and in football stadiums and um, sports stadiums and so on and so forth. Um, another thing is it wasn't all Hitler and political, although it was given a priority. There was a great deal of light entertainment, especially light music. Um, um, light classical music, the operettas, um, and they give examples there um, of, of the type of music that was played. Um, women were especially targeted through the radio, um, uh, being at home. Um, Hitler was anxious that they would not, not be as easily influenced as they were as, as, as um, men who were in the workplace. Um, so a lot of the radio programmes um, were about domestic um, management and encouraging women to, um, to, to buy German products, etc., etc., ersatz materials. So... Um, focusing on autarky and the principles of the four-year plan and how that women could contribute um, to that, which, of course, underneath, beneath it all is all about the preparation for war. Did it work? Um, very famously, the Nazis manufactured the um, people's receiver, lots of cheap radios. Um, that was payable in instalments. Um, so that uh, people could get, would get hold of these radios quickly and then would owe for them. So the radio ownership definitely increased, um, and there's some useful figures there. 25% of households owned radios the year before Hitler took power. By 1939, 70% of, of households owned radios, and that was actually the largest proportion of radio ownership anywhere in the world. So in that sense, very successful. Frequent exposure to the airwaves significantly enhanced Hitler's personal popularity. And there's a quote there, a key factor in developing support for the regime. Remember, um, you, this, this is all ultimately focused on Section B in the examination. Um, but there were failures, particularly during the war years. And you'll see this as a sort of common, tre common trend throughout all of the forms of media. Um, more successful in the years of peace, 1933 to 39, but once the war kicked in, you start to see German people um, uh, resisting. Um, clearly, it, it, the, the media was not working as, as it should. So during World War II, many Germans listened to foreign radio stations, even though that was banned. Very, very difficult for the Gestapo to track that down. Um, when you look at the, the, the essay by um, Evans called The People's Community, um, there's quite a good section in there about how people were listening to the BBC, locking themselves in their bathrooms, etc. I mean, very difficult for the Gestapo to, ca to catch people doing that. Um, so that certainly was a, 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 a failing. Um, so it reflects the unwillingness of the population to believe the blatant lies that propaganda was spreading, especially in the second half of the war, um, when uh, Germany was retreating from 1943 onwards.
cinema. Okay, so the Weimar Republic was a golden era of cinema. Internationally, um, the Weimar Republic produced films that, e that even today, are, um, nearly 100 years later, are regarded as sort of ma master masterpieces of world cinema. Um, well, the Nazis brought that to an end, no doubt about it. Um, the film industry was brought under the control of the Reich Film Chamber. Um, talented filmmakers left Germany in their droves in 1933, many of them going to Hollywood, um, where they finished their careers making westerns and gangster films. And, uh, you know, out in America, the, the films they produced were generally masterpieces, um, but they were originally... Um, filmmakers from the Weimar Republic. Now, the Third Reich produced 1,097 feature films. About one-sixth of them were openly, blatantly political, but the rest were actually purely escapist. And there's a, there's a, a link there with the radio. Remember what we said, that much of radio was light entertainment, the operatas of, jo of Johann Strauss, etc. It was the same with cinema. A lot of it was very sort of, you know, just fodder, um, uh, entertaining films, um, a bit, like, bit like cinema today, Hollywood you know, produces mass sort of entertainment films. Um, the, the political films fulfilled a variety of purposes. They promoted the Fuhrer Princip, they re reinforced the, the, the values of the people's community, the anti Semitic message, and they instilled the message of patriotism and self sacrifice. Um, and some films glorified Germany's past, e.g., there was a film called Bismarck made in 1940. Okay, now in terms of assessment, successes. Um, make sure you give examples of films. I mean, the most successful artistically film was The Triumph of the World, directed by a woman called Lenny Riefenstahl. Technically brilliant um, film about the, promoting the Fuhrer cult um, that was produced very early on in 1934. And Goebbels learned that cinema could be used to put across subliminal messages subtly within the context of a story, that it, there was no need to be blatant in putting the messages across. Um, so, um, Jew Seuss, um, an, an anti-Semitic film made during the war, was quite successful in doing this. There was a historical film made in 1945 called Kohlberg, um, which, although about a completely different era, it put across a subliminal message that it was the duty of every citizen in a time of war to fight to the very end, which of course was necessary in 1945. It's what Goebbels was encouraging Germans to do. Overall, the regime made full use then of cinema as a modern medium. Fairly successful, but there were definite failures as well. So during the war, in particular, cinema became much more lacking subtlety, ra radicalised, much more anti-Semitic tone, and it didn't always work. So there was a, f a film called The Eternal Jew. It wasn't um, directly commissioned by Goebbels. Goebbels was more on the ball um, in understanding how to put across messages subtly, which were mentioned there. Um, but this one, directly commissioned by Hitler, was very, very um, unsubtle. Um, the anti-Semitic message was so crudely put across that audiences just reacted negatively. That was a failure. Kohlberg, the film we mentioned um, earlier there, um, although a, a very effective film, um, it was too little too late. And plus it, it employed um, 187,000 extras. And this was in 1945. And the, th those extras for that film could, of course, be deployed for military duties on the, on the fighting front when Germany was in the final stages of the war. So again, there was that sort of nonsense that was happening there. So overall uncertainty about how to strike the balance between political films and escapist films. Um, you know, Hollywood had a surprisingly strong influence on the style of films that were produced. You look at the, the, the German films made um, in the Third Reich, very, very Hollywood-like um, in their style. Um, a lot of mass entertainment films. But... In terms of culture and in terms of impact, the Nazis never produced a sort of uh, great cinema, um, such as in the Soviet Union. Um, uh, the Soviet, Soviet Union had a, a director called Eisenstein who made some absolute masterworks of world cinema called like, October and another film called Ivan the Terrible, but the Nazis were never able um, to match that um, in terms of the quality of their output. Um, fi finally, um, the press. 
And the newspapers were not as easy to coordinate, as I mentioned earlier, simply because many of them, there were so many of them, and many of them were privately owned. Um, so there's some useful figures there, 4,700 daily newspapers representing a wide range of political and regional views and loyalties. So this is the situation in 1933, what Hitler um, found himself having to coordinate. So know the names of those papers. The communist paper was called the Red Flag. The social democratic paper was called Forwards. The German nationalist paper was called The Day. Um, and in 1933, the Nazis um, got the early stages of Gleichschalten removed most private newspapers. Um, they issued an editor's law in April 1933, um, and the Reich press chamber, led by, and know these names, Max Mann, um, and the overall Nazi press chief, who of course we've come across with his famous memoirs, was Otto Dietrich. And what did they do? Well, news agencies, where newspapers got their news, were amalgamated, um, to a single news agency called the German News Agency, which of course was fully controlled by the Nazis. So newspapers got their news from a Nazi news agency, so they were all given the same version of the news. Journalists were made responsible to the state. So newspapers continued to be privately owned, but editors were held to a, uh, um, were very, very accountable. Journalists could be sacked directly by the state if they, t if they, if, if they just simply towed the line of their editors, and likewise editors as well. Uh, daily press conferences every day ensured that an official line was retained in reporting. Of course, there was a Nazi newspaper called the People's Observer, um, which had been formed in 1920, but by 1933, obviously, People were strongly encouraged to buy it, so it became the most important newspaper. There were other Nazi newspapers which were very more, more radical. Um, a, 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 an anti-Jewish um, paper called Der Stürmer, and the SS newspaper called the Black Corps, Der Schwarze Corps. In terms of assessment, um, between 1933 and 1945, the number of state-owned newspapers increased from 2.5% of the total to 82%. So there were still some privately owned newspapers by 1945, but on the whole, most of them were brought under state control. News was strictly controlled, all newspapers reporting an official line. But as with cinema and as with radio, and perhaps more so, the very bland form of journalism switched the readers off. Um, so much emphasis on political correctness that although people bought papers because they felt obliged to, they didn't actually read them. So as a result, public interest and readership declined in spite of Goebbels' attempts through slogans such as who reads newspapers gets ahead faster um, to, to overcome this. And overall, throughout the whole period, the Nazi regime failed to generate mass support and enthusiasm for newspapers. Got to stop there, I've gone over the time. Um, so move on to the second podcast, which will focus on culture. Thank you.